Hello friends, Dota Alchemy, Dota Alchemist here, bringing you another Dota Alchemy video on behalf of DotaAlchemy.com, and in this video, I'm going to be doing a replay analysis of one of my own Necrophos games in solo queue. The first thing that I want to talk about, which dictates the starting items on Necrophos, is Crown versus Null Talisman. So, we have Null Talisman, 515 gold, it gives 3 strength, 3 agility, and then 6 intelligence, and then 3% spell amplification. Then we have Crown, which gives you four all attributes for 450 gold. So Null Talisman's a little bit more costly. You get an extra 3% spell amp, an extra two damage, two int. Um, however, you're losing one agility and one strength because you get four attributes from Crown. So essentially you're a little bit less tanky if you buy Null Talisman, but you have a little bit more damage. However, I think that Crown is much better. And I think a lot of people are reflecting that in competitive games. So Crown builds into Atos, which is an amazing item. It's uh, a TP cancel, it's setup, it's something that allows you to essentially stun somebody with Necrophos rather than having to use your Reaper Scythe. And then it builds into Veil of Discord, which is amazing on Necrophos because Necrophos has scaling magical damage in the Reaper Scythe. He has Wave Clear with the Death Pulse. This item basically synergizes perfectly with Necrophos, especially because with the scaling damage, it means that the Veil of Discord also scales. Uh, and one of the greatest things about Crown, in my opinion, is not only that it makes you a little bit tankier, but you can buy it from the side shop, which means you don't have to use the courier in order to get a crown. And then eventually it builds into stuff. Null Talisman doesn't build into anything. So crown, in my opinion, is significantly better. And therefore, I don't think it's great on Necrophos to start with any items that build into Null Tally, unless you're building these items into something else. So essentially, no more mantles, no more circlets. You just want to get branches or crowns or regen or fairy fires. That is it. You don't buy clarities because Necrophos has no mana issues. It's more so you need a little bit of regen to sustain in the early game before he gets the levels in Death Pulse and Heartstopper. Uh, in this game, I went for a very greedy build, which is Crown, Iron Branch, Tango, because there are four melee heroes on the enemy team, so there's no way they're going to have a good lane against me. So the next thing that I want to talk about is just uh, your first point, what you should put it in. Uh, I save the point usually just because you might need Ghost Shroud if you get hooked into tower or people gank you, something like that. But for the most part, what you want to do to start with Necrophos, due to the changes to how this hero functions and Heartstopper having the health and mana regen associated with it, is you want to uh, Death Pulse the first wave. And I know that sounds kind of insane just because you don't have the mana to sustain constantly Death Pulsing the first wave, but basically this hero was nerfed in the uh, patch where they made it so that Heartstopper now has the HP and mana regen, where his early his early levels are awful, but his later levels are significantly better than he used to be in terms of the regen that he gets, the damage that he does. Necro is strictly a better hero now than he was. So pushing this first wave, you can see the amount of pressure that I'm applying to Slark, not because my hero can actually apply pressure, but because the creeps apply pressure and I can push the creeps into him. So that, in my opinion, is why it's really important that almost always you push the very first wave because now that I'm level two and I have a point in Heartstopper and I have a point in Death Pulse, I can sustain. I am now a strong laning hero and the only point where you can kind of fall behind is level one because Necro is complete dog shit at level one. So once I get level four in Necrophos, I will go for a second point in Death Pulse for more aggressive purposes and a point in Ghost Shroud for defensive purposes. And essentially what I look to do is secure like one or two CS with Death, death Pulse, especially uh, a range creep CS, while also nuking the enemy team with the Death Pulse as well and maintaining uh, my, my range such that I'm in Heartstopper range. And this is basically just going to push the wave and apply a lot of pressure in terms of harass on the enemy team, which allows you to dive and get kills like you just saw in this scenario. Uh, and then cut the creep wave, which is a very efficient way of farming and causes the tower to take a lot of damage, applies a lot of pressure to the enemy team. Uh, in this scenario, we were too deep. This was this was a little too aggressive. Uh, without the ghost shroud and just with Mars having like the stun, they can they can do an awful lot of damage. They end up killing us, which is just our mistake. But this is generally a good way to play Necrophos. I think uh, pushing your limits on Necro will cause a lot of pressure, and causing a lot of pressure as an offlaner will make a lot of space for your team, despite 
feeding and not being good in this scenario. I, I would say that like that was close to being okay, but the fact that we both died probably made it a little bit more feeding than making space. But in a lot of scenarios, uh, playing like that and really pushing your limits, baiting your wand charges on Necrophos, baiting with your Ghost Shroud, baiting with your uh, Death Pulse, and just trying trying to get the enemy team to waste time and overcommit, that sort of play style just works really well with Necrophos in the offlane. So at about 8 to 12 minutes, there is a rotation that I make on Necrophos that I almost always make. In fact, I think this is a great rotation on a lot of offlaners, and uh, here is why. Well, first, here's the rotation. So essentially what you want to do is, of course, uh, push the enemy safely in tower. Generally, you can do this as an offlaner because you're the pressure hero. You can do this by cutting the wave, bringing it to this camp, hitting the tower, uh, you know, just playing in this area by constantly pushing the wave, securing the bounties. Eventually, the tower will die, but once the tower dies, I will almost always look to immediately teleport somewhere wherever the enemy team is looking to pressure and I fight there. I go and I use my reaper sight. So the reason that I think this is such a good rotation and in this situation I go to the bottom lane and it almost always is the bottom lane where the enemy team is looking to pressure is because if you've taken this tower and you can defend this one then there's so much extra space up here that your team is farming that they can't on your side especially if you're down here as the strong pressuring offlaner because I'm kind of the strongest hero on my team at this point. That's the offlane role. That's how it, that's how it works. It's the supports of the offlane. They're good early. Then you have the mid, and then the carry comes online later into the game. So if I put myself in this in this area, and then my team goes up and farms here, so we're farming more of the map than they are. We're getting more gold, and then they're not going to be able to get this tower because I'm there. And if they go on me, my team can just TP and defend it. So essentially, it's a really efficient way of playing the map. In this rotation, in this particular situation, I went as quickly as possible because it's about to hit the 10 minute mark, which means that there's going to be a fight down here. The bounty runs are going to spawn. So if I get a kill, we're going to get two bounties and then one up here. Siege waves are spawning so we could potentially get this tower. So this is a, a, a really uh, well-timed rotation. Just It happened to be well-timed due to the top tower falling at the right time, but I wouldn't rotate if the tower hadn't fallen. So I run at the Pugna, and I know that I need to scythe him because he's a counter to me, and this is the only way that he's going to uh, stop using his, his his ultimate on me. And it's worth scything him because he's probably their strongest hero. Pugna, very similar to an offlaner, even played in the mid lane. He comes on, online early into the game. It's one of the strongest things about the hero, so scything him is definitely... Uh, definitely the play. So we get a little bit of damage on this tower. We get three bounty runes. This frees up the top area for Nyx Assassin to get level six. Ideally, I'd like like an anti-mage or a TA or one of those flash farming heroes that can pressure Slark to be up here because if Slark's getting pressured up here by one hero, because really this is the safest area on the map for my team now. Once this tower is dead, enemy team can't get here. Look at the distance that they would have to travel to get to where their tier one was. Like they are not going to save this guy if somebody's up here pressuring him. And I can't be killed bot because I'm the strongest hero on my team at this point. I have 1,000 HP, I have 11 armor, I have phase boots plus wind lace, I have levels in my skills, I have a, a stick that I can bait. So essentially, this way of playing the map just tends to be very effective in almost every game, and that's why on Necrophos, I'll almost always TP to the safe lane tower, defend it, look to take a fight, maybe even with the smoke, once I take the off lane tower. So I think this game is actually an amazing example of just how good rotating like this as an offlaner is and how game winning it is in Dota and to demonstrate this I'd like to look at the time where I rotate to the time where we actually leave this area and stop playing where somebody's farming elsewhere and we're just playing down in this area um, and look at how much gold we get in that period so we can see at the start here before the rotation actually happens I haven't killed Pugna yet 1k almost 1k gold lead for the enemy team and we'll speed this up so we kill Pugna, of course, that's going to get us a bit of gold lead. We get bounties, that gets us a bit of gold lead. And there are all of these fights that happen down here just by virtue of the enemy team really desperately wanting to get this tower and wanting to, to kill me down here, but I'm just the, the tankiest hero on my team. It's very hard to kill me. So they keep trying to fight us. We keep defending with TPs, with support sitting in the trees. They keep TPing to defend, but this just isn't an efficient way for them to play the map, and clearly it's an efficient way for us to play the map. So even though the kills are going even, 16 to 16, look at the gold lead. We just keep getting more and more and more and more. This is not good for them. Slowly but surely, they are losing the game by positioning like this. And in my opinion, this is just a good, a good example of 
why this is good to do as an offlaner. You can probably do it with the other roles, but just in general, offlaners are the best suited for this because you're the tankiest, beefiest boy, and you can put yourself in this position where you're baiting and you're just wasting time forcing the enemy team towards you. And I think this area of the map is currently the best for it, just because people are so set on getting this tier one and defending this tier one. So there hits a certain point in the game where we've accrued so much of a gold lead just by positioning in that bottom area of the map and constantly wasting the enemy's time uh, by drawing them to that area to defend their tower that they just can't fight us at all. We actually end up taking a range racks and um, tier three just by running at the tower. And then we're in the mid lane. It's just like, all right, let's just run at this. Let's just fight this. Let's fight everything. Um, Dota is very simple when you get to that point where you just know that you're strong enough that you can basically just fight the enemy team at their tower all you need to do is just run at the buildings and that's what we did and we ended up winning the game so that's it for this video thank you so much for watching i do appreciate it and i hope to see you in another video